Welcome, my name is Talene Babikian. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist within the UCLA Health System um, in the Department of Psychiatry and also Pediatric Neurology. And um, we'll be speaking to you today about learning difficulties and cognitive difficulties in children. And then focus a little bit about um, head injuries and concussions since that seems to be a hot topic in the media and may interest many of you uh, as well. Uh, before I begin the presentation, you have the hashtag for questions. You're welcome to submit. And at the end of the talk, I'm happy to answer as many of your questions as, as possible. So within the field of clinical neuropsychology, especially if, if you're working with children, um, there are a number of risk factors and protective factors um, that would uh, suggest any cognitive issues that would be important to address. Um, I'll go over that and also focus a little bit on specific learning disabilities, especially with an example of, of reading, uh, to give you a sense of what kinds of things to look for and what kinds of things to um, pursue and follow and to evaluate. And then we'll uh, focus a little bit more on, on head injuries and concussions. So uh, what is neuropsychology? Neuropsychology is the interface of the brain and behavior. So if there are any questions about uh, emotional issues, cognitive issues, uh, learning difficulties, social difficulties, a neuropsychologist would be called in to uh, consult to be able to evaluate what the different uh, issues th that are going on may be and how to address them. Um, within the pediatric population, I've listed a number of the disorders and uh, challenges kids might face and the kinds of labels you may hear, cognitive disorders secondary to a medical condition, uh, language disorders, ADHD, and all the executive kinds of difficulties um, children with that disorder may have, social and communication disorders, um, this would be autism and related difficulties, a number of developmental challenges, uh, but also emotional difficulties as well in terms of depression, anxiety, and many times uh, many of these things go hand in hand. And so it's important to uh, address as many as possible. So if you work with children or if you have children, there's a number of risk factors that may clue you into um, that there, there may be processing issues or cognitive issues that a particular child is having to deal with and understanding what some risk factors are may help you um, focus attention to some areas that um, a child might need help with. So if there's any kind of genetic disorder um, that you know of, or if there's a family history of learning disorders or ADHD or similar kinds of things, obviously that's a risk factor and we want to be careful about any symptoms that we see in, in youngsters. Environmental neglect kinds of issues, uh, nutrition, deprivation, uh, obviously medical conditions, we're talking about epilepsies and brain tumors, um, strokes, but then a, a number of insults as well. So we're talking about things like prenatal substance exposures, um, perinatal factors such as low birth weight or any kind of a birth complication, uh, obviously a head injury, uh, accidental injury or inflicted injuries, any infections um, and other insults to the neurologic system in general. Uh, chronic medical illnesses, oftentimes we neglect those, we forget those, um, that those have ramifications in terms of a child's cognitive and processing abilities. Medical treatments, uh, including radiation, chemotherapy, and also any kind of chemical expo exposure, such as lead. So when I put up those risk factors, I also like to put up some protective factors because um, Risk factors many times we can't do much about, but protective factors are areas that as clinicians or parents we can potentially intervene. So we know from a wide range of difficulties and challenges that when kids have someone that they feel connected to, whether it's an adult, a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, it's very much a protective factor. So that's something to, to keep in mind, is even though a, a child may be struggling uh, and facing some challenges, if they feel like someone is um, looking after them, is helping them, or is there as a supportive role, it's um, definitely a protective factor. Parental concerns about educational achievements, and again, part of this child feeling like they belong, the sense of belonging is, is really important. Um, and secondly, early in the right kind of intervention. Um, 
many times, we all have areas that we have challenges in and difficulties in, uh, but understanding what those are and receiving the right kinds of supports and services, especially for young children, really makes a difference in terms of outcome. So what is a learning disability? Um, basically, it's the inability to attain academic achievement in a range of areas. Usually it's math, reading, uh, some processing difficulty or writing difficulty uh, for a, a student given their abilities and potential. Um, we want to make sure it's not secondary to some other thing like anxiety or low IQ, um, ADHD or some other processing kinds of disorders. Um, but it's also important to, to understand that having a learning disability is not a prescription for failure. Again, the importance of identifying early and providing the right kind of intervention in a timely manner really makes a difference. And Students with learning challenges go off and do many, many wonderful things and have um, many opportunities to excel uh, if they have the right support and structure in place. In terms of prevalence and, and comorbidity, I've written approximately 5% of public school children are diagnosed with the learning disability and receiving some kind of services. In reality, there's probably about 15 to 20% more uh, children in school-aged children who have undiagnosed difficulties who would probably benefit from some kind of intervention or, or structure. Dyslexia, which is a neurologist term basically for reading difficulties, is the most common, uh, but it's also the most treatable and the most easily identifiable at a very young age. So again, uh, identifying early and providing the right kind of intervention really makes a difference in terms of trajectories uh, long term. It's important to realize that a lot of learning difficulties have comorbidities with a number of uh, emotional kinds of issues. They go hand in hand. It's almost difficult for me to think of a child I've worked with with uh, even a subtle learning issue who doesn't have a little bit of anxiety or some other kind of internalizing or externalizing symptoms. So when we see difficult behaviors, challenging behaviors, it's important to look more broadly and see what, what else may be going on. Um, behavioral problems like cheating, lying, stealing, uh, all of these things uh, tend to have some root in some kind of processing uh, or cognitive challenge at times. So it's important to, to um, address that. Here's an example just to show you the degree to which we can make changes in, uh, on a structural, functional brain level when we provide the right kind of intervention to, um, in this example, a, a nine-year-old boy who had a pretty significant learning disability in, in reading. So the top two brains, the left and right, um, right hemisphere, left hemisphere, are the child's brain uh, and the, the lit areas are areas of the brain uh, that are being used when the child is engaged in the process of reading. And this pattern actually happens to be an atypical pattern for the process of reading. After about 80 hours of intervention, very focused phonics-based in intervention, we actually see changes in the way the brain is able to um, process reading material and reading information in this second set of um, pictures it uh, is actually representing the way uh, a typical brain looks when we're engaged in the process of reading. So again, early intervention, the right kind of intervention, makes these structural and <laughs> functional changes in the brain that, that, that are then manifested as uh, improvements in, in ability. So what are some red flags? Uh, again, if you work with children as uh, clinicians or teachers, or if you have children yourself, um, when there's resistance as a clinician and as a parent, that to me is a sign that there is a challenge. Because if kids could do what we ask them to do and they could make us happy, um, why wouldn't they? So if they're resisting, if they're challenging us, there usually is something that is getting in the way. So if you have a child who's quitting, who's getting frustrated, who's clowning around, who's uh, controlling, in some situations, avoiding for the fear of failing, uh, being aggressive, bullying uh, others, denying their difficulties, uh, being very impulsive and careless just to get tasks over with, um, are a number of red flags that uh, usually indicate that there's some difficulty that needs to be addressed. These statistics are a little daunting. 
but it goes to show you the degree to which difficulties in learning and cognitive processing sometimes manifest in um, challenges in our social life and our um, sort of place in society that, that are linked. So for example, 60% of prison inmates are illiterate and 85% of, of juvenile offenders have reading problems. Uh, in L LA County, over 50% of suicides under the age of 15 are diagnosed as having a learning uh, disability. And that's not to say that if you have a learning disability, um, you're going to commit suicide. But obviously, if there are any psychiatric challenges, uh, vulnerabilities, having these learning issues that really affect core self-esteem and ability to kind of engage and be efficacious in our world um, really push those uh, psychiatric vulnerabilities um, over the edge. So if you have a student and you're wondering about whether or not they have difficulties and what kinds of services they'd be, um, uh, that would be available to them, one way is to request it through your school district. Even if your child is attending a private school, uh, your local public school will have a process by which an evaluation can be done so that interventions can be put in place. There are some limits and challenges to school evaluations. They're highly focused. Um, in terms of finding particular categories of difficulties kids may have. So if your child has multiple or doesn't necessarily fit into one of those very structured boxes, uh, then uh, you may walk away and feel like, you know, we still have issues, but a, a very focused uh, single diagnosis was not uh, achieved. Um, there's also this wait to fail approach where kids are um, expected to try and um, uh, show that they're failing below what would be expected for their grade level or for their age level before interventions can be put in place. And by that time, many times, kids are starting to feel um, losing motivation and not feeling good about themselves. So that, that, that approach sometimes has difficulties as well. If a student has been evaluated and by the school district and parents feel like uh, they need a second opinion or for more information, there's a process by which they can request a, a third party evaluation to be done to get more information. And obviously parents can always seek private evaluations through uh, private clinicians in the community or um, through your um, local hospital or, or program. Uh, we've talked about this um, already to some degree, but why is it important to accurately diagnose and treat early? You want to avoid a snowball effect. Um, you want to keep a student from fa falling behind. And you want to avoid all the, uh, again, ch challenges to motivation, to self-esteem, to other problematic behaviors that may be secondary to uh, some cognitive or processing difficulty that your student is having. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit more on cognitive issues and learning issues with a population that, ha that I've worked with um, more closely in the last 10 years or so, um, traumatic brain injury in children, uh, and then focus a little bit more on concussions, more mild injuries, since that seems to be a hot topic in the literature recently. So if we look at the literature, um, there's pretty extensive information about the kinds of cognitive issues and learning issues that kids with tra traumatic brain injuries can present with. And I've listed sort of the bread and butter of what neuropsychologists tend to measure. Um, and in many of these domains, we see um, problems uh, with kids with a traumatic brain injury to varying degrees. And there are several factors that would determine um, to what degree these these um, cognitive skills would be affected. So we're talking about intelligence, just general cognitive functioning, uh, learning and memory, attention, information processing, executive skills, uh, adaptive uh, skills, flexibility, sort of mental flexibility, uh, motor abilities, obviously academic achievement, which is supported by uh, all these other um, more basic skills that I've listed. But then a number of psychiatric and behavioral kinds of things as well. So novel ADHD or um, mood and anxiety difficulties as well. It's a pretty busy slide that I've put up here, but this is a summary of the literature um, 
looking at all the studies that have been published for children with mild, moderate, and severe injuries. And the colors in the boxes are coded so that the lighter one is a more mild injury, um, the middle one is a moderate injury, and the darker one is a severe injury across a range of cognitive skills that, again, um, were measured. Zero would be no different. So these are children with brain injuries. Zero would be no different than their counterparts, their healthy, normally developing counterparts. So we can see that the um, more severe the injury, the bigger the gap between what a child with that particular severity of injury is performing relative to their healthy controls, their normal controls. The first bar is um, relatively soon after injury, up to six months after an injury. And the second figure is two years or more. So a lot of the difficulties and challenges we see uh, actually persist up to two years and many times more um, beyond the injury itself. I like this bottom line summary graph. Um, of pages and pages of data that were collected, um, it's important to keep in mind that this is on a group level. So we would never uh, work with one student and say, you know, because of their injury severity, we would pre predict them to be there because there's a number of factors that actually contribute to um, a child's recovery trajectory and um, how they continue to develop and uh, master skills that they haven't master, mastered yet. But in general, if we're looking at time in this axis right here and general cognitive functioning, if we have a child that's typically developing uh, without an injury, we have that darker line that just shows their trajectory of um, increasing their skills over time. With the mild injuries, initially we have some difficulty in terms of cognitive functions. Um, but over time, they don't look much different than their healthy counterparts. What's interesting is that with the moderate and severe groups, initially they look uh, alike. The moderate group tends to show the same rate of improvement over time, but may lag uh, if we compare them to their uh, healthy control counterparts. What's most interesting and really important to keep in mind is that this very severe group, even though they have a positive slope and are showing um, ability to uh, learn and improve, their rate of um, acquiring new skills is slower. So that if we follow them over time, we see a gap, a bigger gap between them and their healthy control uh, counterparts. And we think that's important because many of the skills that a youngster may not have learned yet um, are supported by these initial basic foundational processes of attention, of processing, of executive skills. So if those are disrupted, then we don't have um, the building blocks to do more higher order kinds of things. And that may be one reason why we see this lag. But again, we would never pick a particular child and put them on a given trajectory. There's a number of things that determine how a child would progress. Um, time since injury is a big one, aged injury. Um, it was originally thought that younger would be better, and it is in some cases in terms of uh, more um, focal injuries. But with these diffuse injuries, younger is actually not better because there's disruptions in these networks um, that support these, again, basic cognitive skills. And so you have an injury superimposed on development, and many times that has negative consequences. Uh, and a number of injury severity kinds of variables, how long a child was in a coma, and um, again, what their pre-injury status was. I've put up the risk factors, and here are the protective factors. And these may be some of the areas that as parents and as clinicians, um, we can find avenues to intervene. So even with a very severe head injury, and um, there are a number of things that help determine the course of recovery that actually have um, a, a protective effect. So parenting style, um, family resources, in terms of not just um, financial resources, but the um, wherewithal to uh, seek for help, to ask for services, uh, to be able to find programs and interventions that, that are helpful. Uh, family environment, 
again, in terms of conflict and communication styles, uh, coping styles and emotional versus a problem solving um, method and social disadvantage. So we may not be able to do much with social disadvantage, but as clinicians or as providers, teachers in the community, if we're able to plug in parents and families with a child with a traumatic brain injury, um, with programs and services that are able to empower them and to help them, uh, we can subsequently change the trajectory of outcome. And that's a very, these are very important sort of key things to, to keep in mind. Uh, I talked before about superimposing um, injury on development. I think one of these slides, um, they look like they're identical copies. One of them was replaced. So if you can imagine, this is a child initially after an injury. That's a child af um, about a year after. Uh, and if you imagine, use your imagination, take away maybe about, uh, half of these fibers. Uh, what we're finding in our study is that initially um, there are limited connections from regions of the brain to other parts of the brain that support these networks that help us with processing and higher order cognitive functions uh, that recover then following, uh, following an injury. And that's sort of what we've been interested in in, in the studies that we do. I'm going to focus a little bit on concussion and mild injury, since that seems to be a, a big hot topic in the media uh, recently. And if you're parents out there with children, there's a number of things that come to mind that I think are important to consider uh, when you have youngsters who are involved in, in sports. So if we look at the big circle, which is a totality of all of brain injury, um, it's important to realize that most of those are mild. And um, many of the mild injuries get better on their own. They resolve with no residual difficulties. What's important to keep in mind is this little purple circle, which is about 10 to 20 percent, even of the mild group, that has disabling problems and consistent difficulties that are above and beyond what we, we would expect given the severity of their injury. And so those are the ones that uh, come to clinical attention that, that we want to take a look at more uh, closely. So what is a concussion, you may ask? It's a biological process that affects the brain um, that's induced by physical forces. It doesn't necessarily have to be secondary to uh, um, an actual hit in the head, uh, but it's the way the brain moves within the skull and the changes neurometabolically that that may have, even if it's temporary and transient. Um, is what um, sort of the biological underpinning of what a concussion is. Symptoms start fairly quickly. Um, you don't have to be unconscious. Um, and without much intervention, symptoms get better. And many times on clinical scans of the brain, we don't see abnormalities. These are some common symptoms. You don't have to have all of them. Uh, headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and a number of other things. There's loss of coordination, disorientation, confusion, difficulty with memory. So if you have a child or an athlete who may have um, had a concussion who's presenting with these symptoms, these are the ones that, to, uh, that need to be uh, paid attention to so that the athlete can be removed from play um, and they can be given time, time to recover. What we know is that the course of mild TBI or concussion, and, and for this talk I'm using those inter interchangeably, uh, is self-limiting and very predictable. In adults, it takes about a week or so for symptoms to resolve. In children, it's a little longer. It can be up to two weeks, so that's an important piece to keep in mind. Um, permanent cognitive, psychological, neurological consequences are highly uncommon, despite what you may hear in the media. Um, and whatever s effect there is, whatever difficulty there is, is usually small and transitory. And many times there are social, personal, and premorbid factors that are part of the picture as well. But going back to that purple circle again, this 10 to 20 percent, which uh, come to clinics and clinicians presenting with these disabling issues, um, secondary to what seems like a um, pretty straightforward and simple concussion. To illustrate to you um, how we sort of conceptualize that purple circle, here's a summary of a study that was done by our group. Um, 
where we looked at kids with concussions that presented to emergency rooms uh, as our head injury TBI group. We had another injury group, so the same emergency rooms were used to recruit kids who um, had an injury other than to the head. So these were kids with uh, twisted ankles or lacerations or, or some other issue. And then we had a non-injury group, just our healthy control group. And we wanted to see uh, their cognitive functioning of the three groups over time. What we found was that if we just look at our entire sample, all of these are significant. So statistically, we would look and say, yes, there are group differences in memory and attention and executive skills and vocabulary on all of these measures. But what's important to keep in mind is that when we actually break apart the groups and look at them separately, we see that our head injury group, our concussion group, is um, different from our control group. But turns out that our other injury group, who did not have a head injury, is also different than the control group. So whether or not you hit your head is not the determining factor of who has uh, cognitive problems. It's the fact that you were hit somewhere uh, where you were injured and presented to the, to the hospital. So these may be kids who are, um, have ADHD or a little impulsive, maybe a little aggressive. Uh, running in the street, get hit by a car, or um, some other, uh, other things that, that would put them at risk. So we have our three groups again. We look to see uh, and notice that about a third of both of our injury groups had neurocognitive difficulties a year after versus only about 18% of the healthy group. So we wanted to see what factors we can pull from our database to be able to predict who has issues. And what we came up with was the kids who were cognitively impaired at 12 months were the kids who were cognitively impaired at one month. And the kids who were cognitively impaired at one month actually had difficulties before. So the kids who are having problems after are the kids who are having problems before. And noting that, again, as parents or as clinicians or teachers, is many times we see the end point. We see a concussion, we see a kid having trouble with cognition or concentration or attention, and we immediately attribute it to uh, their concussion. Uh, but many times there are some premorbid um, factors that play into that and are important to address. Um, and when the focus is on the cognitive skill, um, you know, be, gets put under a microscope. And so um, understanding where that symptom is coming from helps um, focus your intervention and, and efforts. The kids who do end up with long-term problems, so post-concussive syndrome, tend to have a certain profile. Um, they ha may have a little more severe injury. Um, they're the ones with headaches, including a history of headaches or migraine. Uh, who they tend to be younger. They tend to have a history of a prior concussion. Um, and then a number of non-injury factors in terms of the level of pain, uh, again, misattribution of their day-to-day -day difficulties to the concussive process itself, other psychological factors, anxiety, um, and, and so forth, and uh, sometimes symptom exaggeration, although we don't see that very often. Which brings us to our newly formed UCLA Brain Sport Concussion Program. Um, we have a multidisciplinary clinic, including neurology, neuropsychology, nursing, sports medicine. And we see kids um, through all the way to, into um, ages 40, 45. And those are the professional athletes that are typically retiring or retired. Uh, and can do a number of tests that look at different aspects of functioning after a, a concussion to help put together, again, a multidisciplinary intervention and treatment program uh, that could have many uh, components. And so um, it's sort of a one-stop shop to be able to address a number of things that um, would contribute to post-concussive symptoms. Uh, and so whatever we can address within clinic, we're able to do. And the uh, remaining issues we can refer out to uh, to get further work up for. As a neuropsychologist, though, uh, many times the questions that come to clinic are, you know, we have a, a child presenting with concussive symptoms. 
is it really post-concussive or is it a number of other things? And again, many times ruling out these other issues, which many times seem to be uh, the driving force behind the concussive symptoms is really important. Is there a premorbid history of depression? Is there current depression? If you have an athlete who really wants to go out and play uh, and has been pulled from their sport, obviously they're depressed and not, you know, they have this big hole in their schedule and in their sort of activity level. So um, understanding that and helping them transition through that is very helpful. Neurologic symptoms, if they have headaches, Obviously, if you feel crummy, if you're in pain, you're not going to be able to concentrate and, and learn and memorize things. Uh, you just don't feel good. Are there uh, premorbid issues with ADHD, executive kinds of things, learning, thing, uh, learning disorders and difficulties? Um, so again, looking at all these different aspects is important because there's a very high overlap between the, these symptoms and post-concussive um, syndrome. In our clinic, um, we have parents walk away with a form that they can go back to school with that will have sort of a regimented return to activity and sports, um, but also a number of recommendations in terms of school. I put a, our study of moderate to severe traumatic brain injury um, where we recruit kids with pretty significant injuries into our one-year observational study. If you have children you work with who would fit criteria um, and they're interested in receiving a comprehensive neuropsych evaluation and imaging, then information for referral is down below. We're actively recruiting the tail end of the, the project. And here's information about our UCLA Steve Tisch um, Brain Sport Program. Uh, our website is there. Dr. Giza, who directs the program, is there. There's a, a clinical component, obviously, to help with clinical issues and return to play issues. Um, we do baseline assessments for schools. And also, there's an education and research component as well. And finally, if you wanted more information online, the CDC has a wonderful website, a Heads Up, that will have uh, lots of information for clinicians and parents who are interested in finding out more uh, about what kinds of things to be mindful of and uh, what kinds of questions to ask. So I'm happy to take any questions regarding any of the information that I've shared with you. Uh, and I think questions are coming in. So the first question is, how do you know if it's a learning disability or just self-esteem issues? And again, it goes back to having a very comprehensive evaluation. A learning disability and self-esteem issues pretty much <laughs> always go hand in hand. Um, so if we look at different aspects of processing, if we look at ability, um, if we look at um, not just test scores. I think the test scores are, are a small component of what a clinician, what a neuropsychologist would do. It's watching someone take tests and um, uh, watch their process to be able to tease apart what actually is uh, a cognitive challenge and to what degree self-esteem and anxiety and these other emotional kinds of things uh, impact the way they're able to process information and learn. So if we have this wide array of data points uh, from test taking, the actual scores, the process of test taking, um, and also gather, we gather a lot of information from parents that are developmental, um, teachers, and anyone else that would be working with a child to get a good sense of um, how they perform under different conditions to be able to tease apart um, actual ability from a degree to which their ability is impacted by these emotional kinds of things. Our second question is, at what point would you pull an athlete from sports after they've had concussions? Um, the answer to that, I think, is not straightforward. Every family, every child is a different case, and it's a process, again, that you go through with uh, kids and their families. Um, there are some scary data out there about the long-term cognitive um, ramifications, but the data is very unclear and not strong enough to um, 
ignore the benefits of sports in terms of physical activity and in terms of mental health, in terms of social skills and team building and self-esteem building. The benefits of participating in sports uh, clearly outweigh the risks of engagement. There are two things that you'd be want to be mindful of is one, to prevent injuries to the best uh, we can. So this includes coaching skills, um, parenting skills, again, team building and attitude um, in, in sporting events. Um, but then also when an injury does occur, and they do occur, uh, to be able to identify it early and to treat it early and to monitor the, uh, t t uh, the injuries. And so even with multiple injuries, um, making sure that the, the child is given enough time to recover uh, is really important. And then checking in to see um, where they are in terms of their process and in terms of their um, desire to return to activity and play and coming up with a plan that works for them um, and their families then becomes really key. So it really is a case-by-case -case, um, situation and not one model would fill, would fill uh, all the, the families. I suspect that my child has a learning disability. What should I do is the next question. If you have any suspicion, the important thing to do is to not ignore the issue. So um, if within the school system, again, there's a process by which many of the learning issues can be identified. So that's one place you could go. Uh, other places would be in the community, whether it's your local hospital system or a clinician in private practice that would do a full evaluation. And it's important, again, to if you have suspicions that your child has ADHD, you don't want to go do an ADHD evaluation because many times what presents as ADHD uh, could be a, a number of other factors. So having this sort of comprehensive, bigger picture perspective information will give you a lot more information to work with in terms of um, both diagnostic um, perspectives but also in terms of interventions. So for example, ADHD is diagnosed by a number of symptoms. So if you have children who are inattentive, who are not paying attention, who are not finishing work, who are maybe impulsive, or uh, a number of symptoms that parents and teachers report, you have the diagnosis. But it's important to understand why those diagnoses or symptoms are there. Is your child inattentive because they're having hearing issues? Uh, are they inattentive because they're being bullied? Uh, and their focus is somewhere else? Are there things going on in the home that are, are, that are challenging? Do they have a processing or working memory issue um, that may look like more classic ADHD? So again, taking a broad perspective will make sure that you don't hiss, miss some more subtle issues that can be addressed uh, adequately. And finally, can my child receive special education services if they're attending, if they're attending a private school? Absolutely. Even if you have a child who's attending a private school, your local, local school district is a good resource to at least get an evaluation and many times put in um, services as well. Every, pub, every private school is different in terms of what they offer, in terms of special education needs. Uh, so it would vary from school to school. And if your private school is not um, equipped to deal with your child's specific issues, uh, then at that point you may consider some alternatives uh, in terms of schooling. But your school district um, is a good resource if you have any questions about um, getting an evaluation and at least starting some services. So with that, I'll end. And I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak with you and the questions that came in.